time for kids time. Yay! All right, let's sing our kids time song. We do our actions. Building up the temple, building up the temple, building up the temple of the Lord. Now we're going to shout. <laughs> Building up the temple of the Lord. Now we'll do it really quietly. Shh. Building up the temple. Building up the temple. Building up the temple of the Lord. Shh. Building up the temple of the Lord. All right. Who was the loudest that time? Was it the girls or the boys? And who was the quietest? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, shh. All right. Very good. We love our children here. We love our old folks here. We love everybody here. Isn't that right? Everybody's welcome at Logan Wesleyan. All right. We, each week we talk about some of the words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus says, turn away from your sins and trust him, and you can be part of his family. And we're also reading through 1 Corinthians. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says the most important thing is to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Do we have a cross in our church? Where is our cross? Can you see it? Over there, we hang it over there. And where? Oh, there's one on the table here too. Ah, there's one up the back. There's crosses everywhere. All right, we remember what Jesus, who Jesus did for us. And when we had our communion this morning, that's part of it. We remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. He gave His body. He gave His blood for us. All right, we are working our way through First Corinthians. We're reading different verses, but first we're going to do our mystery box. All right. Oh, my goodness. All right. The other box has been turned to another purpose, and so this one I've brought instead. This is the new mystery box. All right. So I'm going to give you some clues, and you have to try and tell me what you think is inside. The thing that's inside here is very, very cheap, and in the right circumstances, it's priceless. Any suggestions from people who haven't peeked in the box? What? What do you think it is? It's not a cup. What do you think? Socks. If you want some socks, talk to us about socks. A soul. Ooh, I'm not sure I could fit a soul in there. No, I'm not sure. Hmm, good. Ooh, interesting. All right. This thing is it's very, very cheap. Is Jesus very, very cheap? Not a child. And priceless. This is something that I am sure every single child in this room uses every week, and that sometimes grown-ups use it as well. Phones, no, not a phone. They're not cheap. Phones are not cheap. All right, anything else? Clothes, because cl grown-ups only use clothes every so often. Okay. It's not a drink bottle. Okay, something else. This something, it's not a pencil, but you're getting closer. <coughs> this thing is for... When something is really, really important and you've made a mistake and everything's falling apart, what are you going to do and you have to fix it? What is it? An eraser. That's right. So I've got in here. I've got a couple of little erasers. See, when I was in school, we called them rubbers, but I think you call them erasers or rubbers. You use them to rub out your work. So when you make a mistake, you rub them out. Who uses one of these at school? Most of you do. Because what we write down, sometimes we write things down and we make a mistake and then you're stuck. What are you going to do? You have to rub it out and try again. And we can always rub something out and try again, can't we? We can always have another go. We're going to read a little bit from the Bible now that talks a little bit about that. So who would like to be a reader this morning? It's not a long one this morning, so only a couple of readers. We might start here. Or do you not know what wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
Okay, so Paul's saying there are things you can do wrong which puts you outside of God's kingdom. Are there any readers over here want to read? Got fame? Neither thieves nor greedy nor darkens, drunkards, jockards, or nor slanders, slanderers, slanderers yes. nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so swindlers are people who cheat and steal and trick. It's an old word for a tricker. All right. So he's saying these people will be outside of God's kingdom. That's bad news, isn't it? But what is what he keeps on saying? Who would like to read next? And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, sanctified, you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit of our God. By the Spirit of our God. Very good. That's it. It's only a few verses this morning. So he's saying... There are people who are outside of God's kingdom, thieves and drunkards and slanderers and swindlers. They're outside of God's kingdom. And he says, and there were some people like that in the church. But it's okay because God came along with his rubber and he rubbed out the bad things they had done. They were able to write in a new thing, a good thing. And so they weren't thieves anymore and they weren't slanderers anymore. They'd all been been rubbed out, erased, and they'd become new people in God. Is that good news? I think that's very good news. Is that good news, grown-ups? Oh, yes. Oh, very good. All right. So we're going to stop there, if that's all right. We don't have Sunday school at the moment because it's school holidays, but I think we have some activity sheets up the back. So go and see Ms. Roz. She'll give you an activity sheet. And Normally, we stop and have everybody shake hands. So everybody shake someone by the hand and say, good news, God has rubbed out your bad past. You don't need to say that. You can say whatever you like. But you might like to say something like that. Shake someone by the hand who you haven't greeted this morning as we get ourselves organized. Amen. Amen. If you've come in this morning and didn't get a copy of our notes, please put your hand up. Someone will bring you our notes so we can follow along and see what we're talking about this morning. Ten years ago this week, I was here. This is the cathedral in Washington, D.C. I'd gone over there to tour some battlefields because that's what I'm interested in. And we arrived, and the next day we after we arrived was a Sunday, and the fellow I was traveling with was very jet-lagged, and he did not get out of bed. And I woke up bright and early and thought, I might go to church. And Washington National Cathedral just happened to be around the corner from where I was staying with another friend. And I'd seen this cathedral on television shows, on the West Wing. If you've ever watched West Wing, this is the church where all the things happen. So I thought, I'll go down to this church for worship. Well, I went in. It's a beautiful cathedral built in European style in America. It's massive. It's so long you can lie the Washington Monument down inside of it. Why you'd want to do that, I don't know, but you could. And the people there and the pipe organs and the whole thing... And it's an Episcopal church, so they're American Anglicans. They follow the lectionary. So each Sunday they read certain readings from the Scriptures. And the week I was there, they got up and they read through the readings, and one of the readings went, I went, oh, that's very interesting that they're saying that, that they're reading that reading. Because it turned out very later on, not that much later on, that the pastor did not agree at all with the Scripture. The Scripture was saying some things, which the pastor was against. The church was very pro some things that the Bible said was not okay. And these people had explained away the Bible so they could show tolerance for behaviors the Bible says is not a part of God's kingdom. Well, we're reading through the scriptures over these months, and when we come to bits in the Bible that we don't like, guess what? We have to talk about them. We have to say this is what the Bible says. And we need to change our behavior, our lifestyle, our thinking to match the scriptures and not the other way around. We come to one of those confronting passages today. The kids read part of it this morning. And if you've got sensitive children, you might like to cover their ears when we come to the verse that we skipped over. So this morning from 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, you might like to read along in your Bible or it's there on the screen. Paul says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, 
nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And That is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We are working our way through 1 Corinthians, and Paul is confronting his old church about some issues that they are having, which also confronts the church today because there is nothing new under the sun. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul summarizes his message to the church. Let's read it together. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul keeps coming back to the simple message of Jesus on the cross and what he has done for us. The Corinthians have a number of problems. They have factions. They're following different leaders rather than following Jesus Christ. They have twisted the gospel so they can tolerate and indeed celebrate sin. They have drifted from the central truths of the gospel into a version that exaggerates some things to the point of being bizarre. And Paul is reminding them of central truths. There is a holy God, and he is the one who says what is right and wrong. And those who persist in the wrong will find themselves outside the kingdom of God. Paul gives a list not an exhaustive list of behaviors that are wrong. Sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, homosexual activity, thievery, greed, drunkenness, slander, cheating, swindling. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul is pushing back against their libertarian approach to sin. He is challenging their loose morality that they have found or that they've exaggerated in their freedom. There are standards, Paul says. There are things that define Christians and non-Christians. And Paul is in favor of removing people from the church who bring dishonor or disgrace to the name of the Lord Jesus. The name of the Lord Jesus. We talked about those things a few weeks ago. And Paul is continuing on the theme today. There are two things we must say before we get carried away. First of all, as Christians... We believe that all people are made in the image of God. Yes? Amen. All people have value. They have dignity because they're made in the image of God. And more than this, number two, on our side of the evangelical divide, we believe that all people have immense value and are priceless because Jesus Christ has shed his blood for them. He has paid the price for that person to be saved and live a life of eternity with God. So more than just having value because they're in the image of God, they have immense value because Jesus has paid an immense price for them, indeed an infinite price for them. The people we are talking about today, the people on the list, are of incalculable value because they are born, made in the image of Jesus of God, and they have been bought with the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We must be careful how we talk about people and how we behave towards them. No one has ever been brought to repentance and faith by being mocked and insulted and persecuted. And when the church sides with the bullies, we're on the wrong side. Indeed, it is the kindness of God that brings people to repentance. So with these people on the list, we need to show them the love of God. It has been said, and I saw it in the news this week, that tolerance is not a Christian value. And I agree that this is the case. Christians are not called anywhere in the Scriptures to be tolerant. But what are we called to be? What is the overriding Christian value? If we're not to be tolerant, what are we supposed to be? The answer is love. Yes, Christians ought not to tolerate other people. We ought to love them. We are called to love other people, to treat them the way we would like to be treated, and more than this, to love others the way that Jesus has loved us and given himself up for us. 
And Jesus calls everyone to be part of the kingdom of God. Let's read it together. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. You cannot be a part of God's kingdom if you do not repent, if you will not repent. There are certain ways of behaving, certain lifestyles which just do not fit inside God's kingdom. To come into God's kingdom while being the sort of person on the list, Paul says, is impossible. It can't be done. It's not that God is being arbitrary and mean. It isn't that God or the church has made up a set of rules on the back of an envelope or even on a stone tablet which are not being applied to everyone on a one-size-fits-all basis. Rather, it's that the creator, of, the creator God has unveiled his genuine model for humanity in Jesus. Jesus not only shows us what God is like, he shows us what we should be like, what we ought to be like. And there are certain ways of behaving which just don't fit with Jesus. If you want to be a truly, fully human being, those ways of behaving have to be left behind. Coming into God's kingdom while still being one of those people on the list is impossible. These things have always been contentious in the church. Every generation has its own blind spots, its sudden enthusiasm for some moral rules, its own angry rejection of others. Feelings run high, particularly where strong human instincts are involved. People are quick to react crossly when something they have assumed is perfectly all right, perhaps have been told by others that it's perfectly all right, is suddenly declared to be wrong. It's easy to be deceived on issues like this, to fool ourselves into believing that all is well. Don't be deceived, Paul says. It's one of his regular warnings here and elsewhere. Paul warns it's possible to be on the wrong road without realizing it. Don't be deceived, he says. Sincerity and conviction are not enough. There is such a thing as being sincerely wrong. In our Western world, and like in a pagan city like Corinth, one of the key areas where self-deception could run riot is sexual immorality. In a society on the move where people come and go and sit loose to social and family life, in a city like Corinth, or in many parts of today's world, it's much easier to live irresponsibly since you won't have to face the consequences of your actions. But consequences there are, especially when it comes to sex. We humans are so designed that what we do as sexual beings affects every other aspect of our lives. There is no such thing as casual sex. Sex is far more important than that. And to make sex a little thing, to trivialize it, is to trivialize our God-given humanness. Tell lies in that area inevitably set up a fault line that run through the rest of our character. Many in today's world have drunk so deeply from the anything goes culture that they find the mere suggestion of moral restriction on sexual behavior surprising or even offensive. But the human devastation that results from sexual permissiveness, especially where it involves breaking marriage promises, is far reaching and long-lasting. The actions on the list involve practices that some people find they deeply want to do, so much so that in our day, a novelty of the last hundred years or so, we've seen the rise of special words as identifying labels, a sign of a secret hidden identity which can be discovered or recognized. The Bible makes it clear that this is misleading. There is no special category of person who's permitted to do wrong things just because they have a proclivity, a tendency, an urge. There's just people. We all fit into the same category. Sinners in need of grace and mercy. God's kingdom will be peopled by humans who reflect his image 
who've laid aside their inbuilt tendencies towards selfish desire, who have repented, who have changed, who have grown, and accept by faith what Jesus has done for them. People who reflect the image of God and behavior that distorts and defaces the image will lead in the opposite direction. The whole New Testament joins in warning that this is a real possibility. There is a path that leads to life. and There are many paths that lead to death. But the whole New Testament also joins in announcing that we don't have to follow the paths of our sinful desires because God himself has provided the way in which people can leave their past, leave their present even, and move forward into his future. Paul warns the Corinthians about the things that lead people away from the kingdom, behaviors that are addictive and destructive. And then he says in verse 11, and that is what some of you were. Only some? I think Paul is perhaps being polite and generous to his listeners. I'm sure it was more than just some of them. If we were honest, I think we could all find something on that list to which we have an inner longing to self-gratification, to substance abuse, to greed, to being a swindler and tricking people and getting our own way. But Paul's point is that there are people in the church of Corinth who used to be like this, but no longer. They have changed. They have been changed. They have been remade. They have been declared clean and holy, and they have begun acting clean and holy. They used to be characterized by selfishness, and now they are known by love. And the New Testament is filled with stories of sinners who've had their lives turned around by the amazing sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the ongoing internal work of the Holy Spirit. And the story of the church makes it clear that this is an ongoing process today. People can and do change can and do give up their sin, their selfish ways, their immorality. It is possible today. You do not have to be the way you used to be. Is it easy? No, but it is simple. Is it quick? No, but it does happen in an instant. Is it automatic? No, but it is a work of grace. Paul says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, which is backwards to our theology. We've got our, 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 our lecturer here this morning in, in Wesleyan theology. No doubt he can tell us that what I'm telling you is quite true, that Paul is talking backwards. He's not being a good Wesleyan. If Paul were a good Wesleyan, he'd put the words in reverse order. He would, we would start with the word justified. We'd start with justification, which is the word that the legal declaration, your sins have been atoned for, have been wiped away. You are declared righteous, just as if I'd never sinned. Everybody say that with me. Just as if I'd never sinned. That's what justification means. God says, shoop. You're perfectly declared clean. And then a good Wesleyan would talk about sanctification, the making of saints, of holification, where ordinary people are turned into something more, being filled with the Spirit of God and having every part of life impacted and renovated and made good and holy. Everybody say sanctified, sanctified. And then we would talk about the ongoing washing the daily process of being cleansed and washed with water through the word that Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians, of being cleansed by the word of God, our daily devotions, our daily work with God. If Paul was a good Wesleyan, he'd put them in that order, but for some reason he puts them in the opposite order. He does it backwards, and he must have a point because really he's one of the people we should be studying to make our theology work. Paul is really combining them all into one. He's saying it's one process, it's one thing, because of course it is. We have a tendency to make steps out of everything when it's all just different sides of the same coin rather than distinct processes 
and stages. Paul knows that this new identity and lifestyle does not happen automatically. That's why he's writing this letter. But once faith is present, the way is open to a different lifestyle, a whole new way of being human. Jesus calls us to repent and believe. And when we do, we find that he is there to help us go on repenting and believing. Because repenting and believing isn't just for day one of becoming a Christian, it's for day two and day three and day four and day 5,068 and so on into eternity. Jesus says, repent and believe. You want to be justified? Repent and believe. You want to be sanctified? Repent and believe. You want to be washed clean by the word of Jesus? Repent and believe. He's there to help us repent and believe, to give up our sin and our selfishness and become the people we were meant to be, people who walk and talk and think and act like Jesus. Are there any questions this morning before we come to a conclusion? For those visiting with us, I do like to stop and see if there are questions in case I've said something that upsets, confuses, or you'd like to know more about. Oh, Hans. Okay, so Hans is asking, are we sanctified and washed by the blood of Jesus or the word of Jesus? My answer is yes and amen and both, and for sure. Because Jesus, we, yeah, this is our, this is our german this Hans, you and I. We, we, we are Greeks to the extreme. We like to cut things up, don't we? Germans like a plan. They like to know exactly what everything is. And that's a very Greek, a very Western way of thinking. For our new Australians, us white people, we like to chop everything up into sections to work out exactly what every little section is. But of course, when you chop it up, you've killed it. And so often in where Western theology, we have divided the word of truth so finely that we've turned it into a dull lecture. The answer is yes and amen and both. Jesus cannot be separated from his words. Yes? Jesus, his words cannot be separated from what he's done for us on the cross. And what he's done for us on the cross cannot be separated from the fact that he is God incarnate, coming down and walking among us on the earth. He is the whole package. And so when we try to say this bit of Jesus does this and this bit of what Jesus does, we miss, we miss the point, I think. Good question. Great question. And when Paul, it's all metaphorical language. He's saying this is what Jesus does for us in the vastness of it? Great question. Any other questions this morning? I don't see any. I do remind you, my email address is there, my phone number is there. I'd love to discuss these things with you. If you have questions or concerns or you think I'm wrong, I'd love to have a conversation with you about these things. I want to finish this morning by talking about John Newton. John Newton is probably well known to most of you, but for those who don't know, he was a thoroughly bad man. He was a very wicked man. He was a slave trader. He made his money and his family made their money taking kidnapped Africans from Africa, sailing them across to America, putting them to work in the sugar plantations and all of South America and all of North America and all the rest of it. He was a slave trader. He was a bad man. He did horrendous crimes unimaginable brutality and cruelty and savagery. And then he met Jesus. And guess what? He kept on being a slave trader for a few more years. We don't always tell that part of the story. We sort of think he met Jesus and changed his life 100% there on the spot. No, he kept sailing those ships for a couple more years. And even after he gave up sailing those ships, he still had shares in the slave trade. He still made money out of it for many, many years. But he changed. He grew. He was sanctified. He learned that what he'd been doing all those years was very, very, very wrong. And he lived long enough. Well, we'll come to that part in a minute. He changed. He grew. He became sanctified. He was washed by the water and the word. He changed his life. Jesus changed his life. 
He became an Anglican priest. He became an evangelical Anglican in a day where there were no evangelical Anglicans. He's living at the same time as uh, John Wesley, John and Charles Wesley are at the same time as this. And then, of course, at the end of his life, he is most known for his famous hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. And when John Newton says a wretch like me, he meant it. He couldn't imagine anyone worse than he had been. But God changed him and turned him around and made him a powerful speaker and preacher. And he endorsed people and he mentored people. He worked with Wilberforce. And at the end of his life in 1807, he lived long enough to see the British Empire put an end to the slave trade in Britain. It was another 30 years before all the slaves were set free. It would be another 30 years before the African slaves were set free. And there are still people living in slavery today. But because of John Newton, because God saved him, no matter how far on the path you are to destruction, you can be redeemed. No matter how many of those things on the list that Paul says you've done or are doing, you can be saved. If God can save a wretch like John Newton, then he can save you and redeem you and turn all that you have experienced and done, all of it, to his good purposes. So the song I've chosen for us to reflect on this morning are the words of that slave trader who was redeemed and saved and justified and sanctified and washed and turned around. He was like that list. But God turned him into something else. And he can do the same for you, my brother, my sister. And he can do the same for all the people, whatever letter they choose to assign themselves. Let us sing this morning, Amazing Grace, and think of what Jesus has done for us and how he has saved us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Let us pray. Father God, this morning we thank you for your words. We thank you for your tough words. Father God, there are confronting things that we read in the Bible that do not mesh up with what is going on in our culture in our world around us. Father God, help us to stick to what your scriptures say. Help us to hold true to your way of looking at the world. Father God, also help us to show grace and mercy and love to those people with whom we disagree. 
Remind us always that your son shed his blood for them and for us. Father God, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here who does not know the amazing grace, who does not know what it feels like to have their sins washed away, to be justified, to be sanctified, to be clean in your sight. Father God, I pray that you would come just now by your Holy Spirit and light a fire in their heart that you would speak to them, that you would draw them to a place of repentance and faith. Father God, we, like John Newton, are all wretches in need of your grace, your mercy, your love, your forgiveness. Father God, we thank you for Jesus, in whom your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness are so abundant. Thank you for Jesus and who he is and what he has done. Help us to live, to think, to walk, to talk, to act like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen and amen. I invite our worship group to come. We're going to sing our final songs. I remind you of who we are and what we're about. We want people to meet Jesus. Will you say that with me, please? We want people to meet Jesus. Jesus, because when they encounter the real living Jesus, they will be changed completely from the inside out. We want to grow to be like Jesus. We want to share his message about the kingdom of God, of love and peace and forgiveness. We want to love the way Jesus loves. Because we want people to meet Jesus. So I pray this week that you will grow, you will share, you will love. God bless you, each one. Thank you.